I'm your host, uh, Dale, The Real Seeker. And today I have a really special treat for you guys. I have a, a special guest with me, uh, Justin Briarly from The Unbelievable Show. Welcome to the show there, Justin. Thank you very much, Dale. It's great to be with you. Excellent. I'm, I'm very uh, thrilled to have you on. I, I've been a fan of your, your show, your radio show, since I think around late 2008. Um, so I've been a loyal uh, fan here. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, you, you've seen, I've uh, been listening to your show uh, since I was a Christian with doubts uh, and through the time when I left Christianity because of those doubts for, you know, through my searching phase for about eight years uh, and then th through my conversion and that. So, yeah, there, there's been, uh, Justin Briley has, has been a part of my faith journey. Uh, Gosh, <laughs> so. I'm, I'm, I'm completely honored, Dale, that, that I have played some, some part in your journey and um it's fascinating in a way because you kind of forget how much time has passed and how many people have journeyed with the show for well over a decade or more um and and i can imagine for how for many people it, it you know does become part of part of their weekly routine and and it's an immense privilege to know that i'm i'm part of people's lives in that way even many people who i never hear from will never get to meet but it, it's been really good to connect with you and, and your story dale so, so thank you very much Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, absolutely. And and speaking of that, um, maybe the, the first thing, as you're my honored guest here, is, is to sort of turn it over to you and, and for the audience, for people in my audience that might not be familiar with you, maybe they've been living under a rock or something. Um, yeah, just, just give us a sense of, of who you are, um, your faith journey, and uh, how you got involved with the, the Unbelievable show. Yeah, well, um, I grew up in a Christian family. Um, and so in a, in a way, you know, Christianity and faith was there from an early age. Um, I would say it only really became my own in my mid to late teens. Um, when I had my own, what I would describe really as a conversion experience, I, th I think to some extent, kids who grow up in church and, you know, family and so on with a Christian background, that they, they can't simply inherit that faith from their parents. It has to become true for them them and alive for them in their own way and that, that happened for me in my probably when I was around 15 and uh, and so my my own faith journey sort of you know really started in earnest then I would say um, it, it led me in interesting directions because when I went to university I went to Oxford University there were plenty of skeptics there and uh, hard questions that were asked of my faith at that point but I also had a very um, a great Christian union that I was part of um, and I got involved in various things like a drama group that did kind of evangelistic skits and things like that. Um, and along the way, you know, I was I was learning politics, philosophy and economics at university. That was my subject. And so that was giving me some of those critical thinking skills, helping me to think through issues. And uh, it was around the, that time, you know, my late teens, early 20s, that I really ran into what I would later discover people call Christian apologetics. So I, I don't think I even knew that terminology then, but we started to read people like C.S. Lewis and others. Um, and and I think I found it really helpful to put a kind of um, to, to read those intellectuals who were able to make the case for Christianity. And, and that kind of opened up a whole new world to me, because to some extent, my conversion in my my late teens had been quite a, a subjective, emotional kind of experience in, in many ways. But I think I soon began to realize that I needed to really dig deeper into the intellectual foundations of Christianity once I got to university. And and so in the in the scheme of things that led me eventually having um, met my wife at university, we got married um, uh, and after some time away in Africa where we went on a gap year together, um, she went into ministry and I began to uh, yeah start a career in radio, um, specifically Premier Christian Radio. And having learned the tools of the trade and how to do radio journalism and that kind of thing, uh, about three years in, I went to my boss and said, I'd love to create a space in our schedule where I sit down with non-Christians and Christians to talk about faith, because I felt like there was a, an important thing missing in our output, which was did a lot of talking to Christians about Christian things. But most Christians in the UK certainly can't live in a bubble and will be around non-Christian friends and colleagues and family. And I wanted to give an opportunity for them to to hear what good conversations might look like. And and that was really where Unbelievable was born. You know, um, once a week on a Saturday afternoon, me sitting down with a Christian and a non-Christian to discuss faith, 
and belief. And that's and it grew from there. Um, perhaps most surprising to me was that so many non-Christians started listening. And that was because we started podcasting the show. We were fairly early adopters on that front. And so it wasn't then just Christians we were reaching, but non-Christians. And so that really gave me the sense that I needed to make this a level playing field, make sure that I did justice to both sides wherever I could. And and that's just been a, an amazing blessing, the way that the show has really become a kind of meeting ground now between Christians and non-Christians and, and has grown very much more into a podcast than a radio show, to be honest. You know, many more people now listen via the podcast than the, the radio show. Uh, so that that's kind of been the journey so far in a nutshell. Yeah, uh, I, I fully agree with your your sentiments. I do think it's important to to engage with s- sincerely open minded people and, and try to grasp the truth because you, we don't have all the answers. Right. So sometimes you can get some great, great nuggets from an opposing side and that sort of thing. So, mm. yeah, I'm a fan of, of, of what you do. Um, and I know that you've been sort of branching off recently into other avenues you've been expanding beyond just the, the radio program you know you put you put on conferences you you put out a book um, and that sort of thing and, and you've got your new big conversation so did you maybe just want to take some time to explain some of your new projects your thinking behind those and maybe give us a, an insight into any plans you have for the future that yeah sure yeah well I mean my overall title with premier the Christian organization I work for um, is theology and apologetic editor, and so that includes my role hosting the unbelievable weekly show. But um, it does involve other things, like as you mentioned, the conferences we run. So it's normally an annual conference in London, and sometimes we do stuff overseas as well, as well as other live events during the year. And um, and that's been a great blessing. Obviously, we're we're recording this during this coronavirus lockdown, so we sadly had to postpone this year's unbelievable conference uh, which was going to be a a real corker but we're we're hoping to put it on next year instead Um, but yeah there's been other things boiling away you mentioned the big conversation series and that's um, a special video debate series with some of the biggest thinkers across the atheist and christian spectrum debating some of the biggest questions Um, so you know I, i had the privilege of bringing people together like william lane craig well known christian apologist and philosopher opposite um, Sir Roger Penrose, who's a world-renowned cosmologist and physicist talking about God and the universe, uh, or uh, or indeed Tom Holland, um, who's a well-known historian, opposite A.C. Grayling, um, who's an atheist philosopher, debating the role of Christianity in history and that sort of thing. So so these are top-flight people, um, and really the, the quality of that series and the, the quality of the guests I've managed to bring on is a great deal down to the fact that we had some special funding towards that from the Templeton Religion Trust. Uh, and so we have two seasons of The Big Conversation, which kind of <clears throat> exists on its own website, thebigconversation.show, but can be heard on the Unbelievable podcast. And obviously we host all the videos as well over at the Unbelievable YouTube channel. So that, so that's take, you know, that's been a big focus of the last couple of years, um, bringing those things together. We're in the process of, of seeing if we can bring together a third season, obviously coronavirus permitting. Um, but another, yeah, another project um, came out a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago nearly now, um, my Unbelievable book, which is really the story of the show and my case for faith. And that's why I subtitled it, why after 10 years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian. And that was my attempt to really boil down some of the things I've learned from hosting the show. Um, because at the point where I was writing it, you know, 10 years into doing the show, I felt I'd I'd learned enough to be able to pass on some information, maybe taking some of those big ideas from some of those real scholars and putting them into an accessible format in this book. And that's that's been very well received by both Christians and non-Christians who have read it. So that's that's been really gratifying um, to have that. And, and there are always, always other little projects coming and going. And I'm doing things like uh, another podcast, uh, another fortnightly one I work on called the Ask N.T. Wright Anything podcast, where I sit down with uh, N.T. Wright, who's a leading biblical scholar, and fire a load of questions from listeners at him. And there are videos associated with that. And and I'm, I'm frequently involved in, in other um, parts of the broadcasting on Premier Christian Radio. There's a an interview show called The Profile, which I fairly frequently contribute to and, and and other things but unbelievable kind of remains the main thing that's the kind of the weekly show is the is the thing button. that always happens and um and is is very much my focus for trying to constantly bring new interesting conversations to people excellent yeah just uh one quick follow-up uh so with the with the unbelievable book and i know there was a response book by my 
old co-host uh, David Johnson called uh, still unbelievable and just as sort of a, a quick follow-up I'm wondering what was that like for you to you know you're you're used to hey I've got my role I'm the moderator I'm I'm trying to be neutral and moderate both sides but here no you're putting forward your ideas and you're getting challenged for for once so I was just wondering what what was that like there's sort of a difference it's a really good question because it, it actually is a much more uncomfortable place to be when you're actually making the arguments. It's one thing for me to sit down and moderate two points of view. But when you're obviously putting the ideas out there yourself, you have to be willing to defend them. And and so I, I was really glad, actually, when I heard that David and the others were creating this this ebook, Still Unbelievable, where they were obviously taking my ideas and responding to them. Um, and, and that's fine. And I, I sort of fully expected that, you know, it's in the spirit of the show. To, for, to put those ideas out there and expect them to be critiqued. Um, and I've obviously done a couple of engagements with some of those guys, um, both on my podcast and elsewhere, um, where we talk through some of their objections to what I've written. So so um, in a way, um, it, I suppose it's been an interesting learning journey, not only um, kind of swapping my moderator hat for being the protagonist and writing a book of, you know, putting the case for Christianity, but also then engaging in some of those discussions and debates, which I really hadn't done up to that point. But nowadays I do find myself more frequently, not all the time, but more frequently actually going in as the defender of Christianity opposite someone like, say, I, I did a thing in Oxford last year, um, a sort of student debate um, opposite Stephen Woodford, who's um, well known as a sort of YouTube skeptic um, called Rationality Rules. Uh, and so those kinds of opportunities are, are popping up more frequently because I've published the book. And um, and that's been exciting, slightly nerve wracking as well. Uh, but I hope that in some way, um, because I've moderated so many discussions and debates, I've picked up a few ideas along the way of, of what makes for a good conversation. And and I try to do my best in those situations when they do occur. Excellent. All right. Well, yeah. Um, I, and I love it. I, you know, I, I liked seeing you um, going about with uh, Cosmic Skeptic as well uh, on uh, morality and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, I've, I've appreciated that you're you're branching out and getting into the, the apologist role and, and defending your ideas there. So um, one thing, I, yeah, one section. You. Oh, no worries. Yeah. And you you are well known for, hey, you've you've got the the right attitude, you, you're very um, humble, you're very well-spoken and articulate, and you know, you you come across well to skeptics. And it, it, I have to admit, uh, on my end, I sometimes um, fail in that regard. So I wanted to sort of ask you, in terms of engaging with skeptics and that sort of thing, so in the first place, why is it important for Christians to, to get out there and engage with skeptics? So some some Christians might object, you know, hey, Matthew 10, 14 says some some skeptics we have to walk away from and, and we shouldn't be engaging. Um, are, you know, are, are there any downsides that we should be, be wary of when we're engaging with, with certain skeptics? Um, yeah, and then finally, just to top it off, what would be your advice in, in dealing with skeptics? Because it, there is no one size fits all strategy. Mm -hmm. Every person is different so yeah maybe take it away what, what are sort of the Justin Brierley rules of engagement <laughs> <laughs> well well you know every every apologist worth their salt knows that famous verse from first Peter three fifteen, which is always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have within you um uh, for anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that was in you that I should say um but do this with gentleness and respect so so Obviously, we're, we're called to give a reason for the hope that's within us, but to do it with gentleness and respect. And I think that is, as you say, sometimes what's lacking sometimes in the conversations, especially online that I had. And I can see why. And I've fallen foul of that myself. You know, there, there have been many times when I've hardly been the best Christian witness because I've been more interested in winning a debate than winning the person. And, and um, I, you know, I, I've, I've had my opportunities where I've been as sneering and condescending or whatever as anyone else but I think you live and learn and you have to accept that you are not going to get it right all the time um, and you've really got to <clears throat> learn to train yourself I think to <clears throat> try and see the other person as an individual rather than just a sort of a set of arguments to be knocked down and <clears throat> what that means for me especially I think is being ready to pray for individuals as much as I'm willing to debate them I think <clears throat> I think that's the 
the challenge because we, we so often enjoy don't we the uh, the activity of going into a debate um, because to some extent you know we get to flex our intellectual muscles we get to um, show off a little bit even um, but actually uh, if that's the reason we're doing it ultimately then we're obviously going about it for completely the wrong reasons and we're not going to really ultimately win anyone by that because ultimately it's God's spirit that draws people and we are simply part of um, being used by God in his ultimate purposes in that way and so we need to be ready to pray to be as winsome and gracious as we can and that does involve making those decisions as you alluded to Dale when actually we realize a conversation isn't actually going anywhere fruitful if we get the feeling that someone isn't actually genuinely open to listening or uh, changing their mind there may be a point at which we have to call it a day rather than beating our head against a brick wall pointlessly you know and so you just have to be wise I think um, in terms of deciding what's worth your time and energy and also trying to make sure that you don't simply treat people as arguments to be debated but as individuals to be loved and um, and to be genuinely having conversations with them conversations where you are equally as open to listening as to dispensing I think <clears throat> uh, skeptics and non-christians you know they, they can smell a mile off when someone is really just going in for something in order to win a point or get their points across and uh, genuine conversations are about listening and responding and so I think it's really important for Christians to do that and not to pretend that we have all the answers. We don't. Um, we're all human. We're all limited. I don't know everything there is to know about everything. And to pretend that I do will soon see people soon realize when you're simply, you know, trying to cover things up and uh, uh, and so on. So I think humility, I suppose, is the principle there um, and learning to, to be able to say sometimes I don't know. That's a great question. Would you give me some time to go away, think about it and come back to you and carry on the conversation? Um, and I think actually that goes a lot further than people often think. I think so often the these things are set up in a kind of winner takes all format. Um, but actually, normal conversations don't happen like that. Um, you don't have to be right all the time. Um, it's OK to go away, think about things and come back to the conversation later. So, so my hope is that Christians can be confident by listening and having facts available and and hearing these conversations but also gracious humble and ultimately um win people not just with what they say but the way they say it yeah i think that that's great advice and, and as you said we i think every christian falls short um at some times but the point is we have to have that right attitude look what why are we even doing this it, it's about trying to help the other person and and that's what i think we can keep that in perspective sure we'll make mistakes but you know that will really help us make make the proper decisions so yeah yeah i agree with your your advice there um perfect all right so so, so the next section that i wanted to ask you about is okay so so let's get into the actual evidences as to why you're a christian and in, in the first place i sort of split it up uh, so let's talk about the existence of God first. Um, so I, I guess I would just want to say, what do you think are the, in your experience, I mean, you've got over, I think 2007 you started with the biggest mm -hmm. names, the biggest philosophers or historians, scholars, and that sort of thing. So what are the best arguments that you think are there for God's existence? And what are the best arguments that atheists that you've heard against God's existence? Yeah, um, I, I think there are some really powerful arguments for the existence of God. Um, I mean, I, I in the book, I sort of start with three chapters where I lay out what I think are some of the most interesting, most compelling arguments that I see for God. Um, and one of them deals specifically with the fact of human existence and taking that right back to the fact that we live in a universe that could produce humans, which when you look at it simply scientifically seems to go against all the odds of us you know of, of, of it producing us and so that that would be looking at things like the fine tuning of the universe for life the fact that there is a universe that emerged apparently from nothing in a, in a big bang parity now all of these things while not kind of knock down proofs for the existence of a creator i think strongly for me are confirmatory um, evidence of that hypothesis if you like and disconfirmatory of the idea that we 
that, that there is no ultimate guiding hand um, behind humanity. So, so those are some of the classic arguments I'd bring to bear. Even the fact that we can do science, I think, is is an interesting one. The fact the universe is written in these laws of mathematics, um, which has no apparent there's no apparent reason why we should be able to sit down with a pen and paper and map out the universe in these physical uh, laws and equations. And yet we can. And that, again, seems like an incredible and uh, well, just most extraordinary stroke of luck if it is just a random fact of, you know, reality, because there is no ultimate rhyme or reason to things. It, but it seems far more consonant, again, with the idea that there is actually an intelligent mind behind the universe that put these laws in place and so on. So so I think there's all of all of that stuff for me is pointing in the direction of of an ultimate mind of a creator. But then you you go from outside of ourselves and they, that big picture stuff of the universe to simply looking inside ourselves. I think then you have another very powerful evidence for God, and that is the moral argument, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, Dale. But for those for those who may not be much so much um, for me, this is about uh, recognizing that if we believe that there are some things which are uh, true about right and wrong, good and evil, that there is this objective a sense that morality exists that there are some things we should do and other things we shouldn't do that these exist independently of you know the variations of time place and culture um then it's very hard to explain how these moral values exist um uh, in an atheistic worldview um where we are simply just you know another product of a um a mindless process um because on that sense morality should be purely subjective it's it's simply about what happens to develop in any time place or culture but none of us actually seem to live life like that when it comes to morality um even even the most thoroughgoing subjectivists that i come across when it comes down to it if they get you know hit over the head and mugged for their money um they will tend to say that person did something wrong you know in that moment they we all have this innate sense of justice and right and wrong and the way things should be and yet it's very hard to explain where this particular objective moral sense resides um, in a godless universe. And so for me, our moral sense, the fact that we do believe in these ideas of human rights and values and intrinsic dignity, you know, these things that are enshrined in things like the human declar- uh, the Declaration of Human Rights and so on, it all seems again to point towards something that goes beyond a purely material explanation. I don't think there is a material explanation for those that objective sense of morality. And for me, it makes far more sense to locate that in a moral lawgiver, something beyond the simple, you know, the physical universe, something that actually has, if you like, written this this moral sense, this moral law into the universe itself, into reality. And and for me, that's that's a very powerful argument. And and it's the argument that brought people like, for instance, C.S. Lewis, um, who I mentioned earlier, uh, to theism um, and, and made him realize that he, as much as he uh, had railed against God because of the injustice in the universe. It, he couldn't really speak of injustice and justice without God. Um, it didn't. There, there is no such concept in a in a godless universe. So, so I find that very another very powerful argument. The the argument for morality, um, and ultimately, it's it's less of an argument. But but there's just a, a deep sense I have that most people believe that life is about something. That we're not here by accident that we're not um you know that we can just make up whatever version of you know meaning makes sense for us i I think most people believe there's something bigger to live for there's there's a kind of an ultimate purpose or meaning to life and 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 in that sense i think um that sense that we have that there is an ultimate purpose to live for is again it, it finds its center in god uh, rather than an atheistic outlook. I, I don't think you can speak of any ultimate purpose or meaning in, in atheism. Whereas I yeah. think on Christianity, we can make sense of that feeling within us that seems to go across all times, places and cultures that we're meant to live for more than just today, that, that we're made for something bigger, a, a bigger story. And, and so those those are three things, the things in the book that I describe as um, making sense of human existence, making sense of human value, and making sense of human purpose, I believe God is a, the best explanation of those those three categories, and a better explanation, as I say, than naturalism or atheism is. Let me uh, one one follow up that I, I really wanted to get your take on this. Um, so I, I hear you. I'm I'm 100% with you on um, all of those 
reasons to think that God, the God hypothesis should be privileged over atheism or something. But one of the toughest challenges for me personally when I was researching this is uh, Stephen Law's evil God challenge because it, it seems like it can kind of neutralize. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned the moral argument, for example. Well, why couldn't objective morality be grounded not in an all-good God, but an evil God? Is there a way that you've encountered, and I'm referring to a debate that you did, um, Stephen Law versus Glenn Peoples. This this was a while back in, in your arguments. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I really liked that that show, but I was just wondering, what, what do you make of, of that? Is, is there a way that we can, okay, let's say there's a God that grounds the objective meaning or objective morals and that sort of stuff. Can we privilege a good God versus an evil God, or are they just neutral? Yeah, I... <clears throat> I, I think that the evil God, it's an interesting challenge to it. And, and I think Stephen Law's done a good job of, of trying to kind of pull the rug out from under the, the theist by, by positing this idea of, 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 a, of an evil God who kind of grounds things. Um, I, I, I find it, I suppose at one level, I just find it, um, I, I don't find it uh, an intellectually satisfactory way of seeing ultimate things. Um, that there's there's something very deep within I think humans that that sort of intuit in, intuits that um, goodness love uh, are are kind of the the foundation of things rather than hatred and evil and so on um, and and again that's not something I can philosophically is exactly make an argument for but it's just in, an intuition I think that most of us share that that that's not the foundation of things if you like. Um, I think philosophically speaking, you, you can go to, say, an argument like the, um, uh, the, something like the ontological argument, in a sense, where, where you, you could argue that actually for the, the characteristics that define God have to be these um, maximal characteristics and that um, goodness and love uh, and power and so on. These these have to be expressed in their positive form. Um, it doesn't make sense to express them in in a kind of negative format, you know. Um, uh, and and that uh, there's a sense in which that that for me again, um, and this was the way that I think William Lane Craig, when he had a conversation with Stephen Law on my show about it, went down this route to say it, it makes more sense uh, on a kind of ontological basis to see that the characteristics of of love are. Uh, are what define God rather than uh, a characteristic of um, evil and, and that kind of thing. So that that might be somewhere where I'd start with that. Sorry, you sounded like you were going to say something, no doubt. Oh no, no, I was just saying. Yep, I I agree. Uh, <laughs> I was just agreeing with you. So um, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's sort of uh, it's the same with me. So my main re way to to sort of break the tie was uh, you you call it an intuition. I, I think yeah, it's it's this properly basic belief that that you know mm. call it a census divinitatis or you know inner witness of the holy spirit but i i think that provides us with knowledge and it's a way to break the tie that no look we we really know if there is a god it's it's the good god there isn't this evil god so yeah i'm sort of on the same in the same boat as as you on that front um mm. all right i mean i mean for to me it it, it strikes me you know stephen's argument there is as a it's an interesting sort of thought experiment, let's say. I, I mean, yeah. it doesn't, of course, what it doesn't do is actually disprove God. It, it just kind of says, well, how do you know what sort of a God this is? Exactly. I mean, and, and as far as I can see, the, 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 the evil God argument says nothing really to the cosmological arguments for God and, and those kinds of evidences. But it does obviously try to take, um, take a shot at the God who is all loving um, and, and, and those kinds of aspects of God. And, and fair enough, we need to ask ourselves philosophically why we assume what, you know, whether we should assume that, that God is, does have these characteristics. But, but I think, as you say, and I think you use the, the more philosophically um, pro proper term for it, the, 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 these are properly Sorry. basic <laughs> beliefs. These are um, yeah. things that we don't necessarily have to justify to other people if they simply seem to, to be apparent to us um, on the basis that of, of, of what's been revealed in some sense until we have a satisfactory, you know, defeater of, of that, that idea. Um, but yes, but carry on, Dale. Yeah, yeah. I'm loving this conversation, by the way. It's great stuff. Oh, awesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're, you're the master. So if you're saying I'm doing it well, then uh, I'll believe you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, so Justin, 
let's let's turn our focus now to okay great well that that's god but that's not the christian god so you know what why don't we turn our attention to well, well how do you get to the arguments for the truth of the christian god in particular what what are sort of the best arguments in favor of that that you've heard and and also if there's any arguments that you think are are obviously you wouldn't think they're they're good overall but are there any arguments that atheists have given against christianity that have made you think or you know have to consider that mm, mm, yeah well i mean starting with the first question why, why the christian god in particular i, I mean I, I fully accept that a lot of the arguments i i outlined earlier um could be a, an argument for um the god of islam or, or another religion potentially uh, though i think there are some elements of what's already been said that that point actually to the the christian god i mean i suppose though for me there there is if you like the the book of nature that reveals, if you like, a creator behind all of this and, and this innate, innate sense of, of value and so on. But of course, I would turn to the scriptures specifically um, to, to, to get a handle on why I believe that God has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ and through the story of Israel and so on. And, and I think that's because we have good reason to believe that these, um, you know, that these documents are reliable, that these are true accounts of what happened in history. Um, and because, you know, and ultimately what I go to in, in the book especially is the story of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. And why I believe if that story is true, and I believe you can show it to be historically credible, then you have to take it seriously. And on that basis, you can look at the evidence for Jesus and his death and resurrection. And if 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 that is a true story, then you have the story of who God is as well in, in the same uh, in the same story. So for me. Um, we don't have to kind of exhaustively research all of the other options when it comes to God, you know, and look deeply into every other religion. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing a, you know, comparison and, and looking into all the other religious claims. But if you found the key, as, as it were, that does unlock the door, you don't have to search through all the other set of keys. Um, you're, you're happy that this one fits and this one makes sense of things. And that's that's the way I see the Christian story. If, if it's true that Jesus Christ is who he said he was and that he died and he rose again, then we found the key that fits the door. And and um, for me, that's the way I, I would see it when it comes to the question of whether we've got the right God. You look at Jesus Christ and, and I believe he he makes sense of of all of the data and and our deepest yearnings, actually, uh, of who we want God to be as well. Um, in terms of the arguments that have made me, you know, question my faith i mean many many arguments i mean too many to list probably but i i have if you like along with my listeners put myself in the firing line week to week and so there have been many times when especially when i've been presented with a new way of thinking through an argument which, which has made me take pause and consider um you know especially when you've got a, a very cogent uh person uh, in the studio with you an atheist who is very good at putting a compelling case across then of course you're you're going to have to you know think hard and, and consider things. So you know, the obvious you know answer would be that the problem of evil and suffering is always going to be a problem. You know that it's it's not an easy one to answer why a good loving God allows the level of suffering and pain that exists in the world. And that's that's you know an objection that I spend a chapter trying to deal with. But even even our best theological and philosophical arguments don't take away from the fact that when pain and suffering strike it causes people to question you know and and that's completely understandable so i think that's one of the most powerful arguments that an atheist has um having said that the, the problem for me is that you know if you take god out of the equation because of the fact of evil and suffering well you've still got evil and suffering it's just you don't you have no you, you can't describe any meaning or purpose to it whatsoever so i don't think it exactly makes life better not having god um uh, I, I just think that um what what is a mystery when it comes to god and suffering just becomes meaningless and, and i'm not sure that's you know uh, an equally good place to go either so 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 there is that um there have been numerous challenges to the authority of scripture the historicity of you know the, the gospels and so on which which have given me pause for thought as well uh, when i first had bart ehrman on i was fairly new to the whole area i think of um historical studies and um some of his objections you know in his best-selling book misquoting jesus you know had me really thinking and gave me a sleepless night or two i've got to confess mm -hmm. but actually when i brought on for that discussion i had with him uh, peter j williams of 
Cambridge University, it, it soon became apparent that actually there are always two sides to every story and that many of the claims Bart made in his book and has made in other books are, you know, are the, the, of the glass half empty rather than glass half full type, where he's giving a very specific spin on some of this scholarship. And you realise soon that actually there's another story to be told. And, and that's been a great adventure. And, and in, in a way, I'm, I'm really glad of those challenges that have been thrown my way because they've actually made me appreciate much more the depth uh, of the Bible and the way it actually does stand up to historical scrutiny. It may mean we have to change some of our ideas about exactly what we thought about. You know, some, some of us grow up in churches where the Bible is essentially presented to us as a book that sort of fell out of heaven ready made. Um, yeah. And of course, it's not. It's a book that, you know, has gone through many hands, many voices, millennia. Uh, we need to treat it as, you know, as historical documents. And yet, despite all that, it's got this remarkable consistency and continuity and historical provenance to it that I find in almost no other ancient text of its kind. And for me, again, I've my respect for the scripture and the, the way it portrays the story of Jesus um, has grown because of the the conversations I've had with skeptics like Bart Ehrman. And it's not always an easy process. You know, there are going to be moments when you're 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 wondering, gosh, how am I going to respond to this? But I, I always find in the end that the hard work of looking into it, researching, having the conversations, being willing sometimes to change your mind on some things that you need to change your mind on. Um, but that does pay off. And and it yields, certainly for me at least, it's yielded a, a stronger, less brittle faith because I've realised actually there are some things I can hold on to even more strongly. And there are other things that, frankly, I can, can let go of that maybe weren't actually very integral to Christian faith where, where I've changed my mind on some things. So, yeah, so that's that's a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. No, no, I, I actually relate to a lot of what you said. So I, I, I'm probably going to instantly destroy any respect that you, you had for me at all. But um, when I started listening to your show, I was a King James Version onlyist. And uh, oh, wow. <laughs> so you can imagine when I encountered things like Bart Ehrman, this, this, my faith was really brittle. And, and obviously I, I eventually left. But um, yeah, it, it was tough for me to, to grapple with that. But get your hands dirty um, and get in there because there are answers. There is always another side to, to these arguments and, and you can, it's, 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 I think in order to have like an, in a, a proper opinion, you have to at least seriously consider both sides and then you can make an informed judgment. And a lot of times we have sort of these presuppositions. So, so one of my listeners, Teddy, uh, hello, Teddy. Um, she's sort of in the same boat that we were she she's just encountered airmen and and she's kind of like oh my oh my gosh it, it, this is like the how he's like the wor the worst challenge for christianity i'm trying to give her well check out these sources you know david in uh david instone brewer we've got uh daniel wallace mm -hmm. and all of these guys so so yeah they're, they're we have to be careful and guard against false presuppositions and and by engaging with with people that disagree it can actually give us a stronger faith and, and a more resilient faith and less brittle I think is the way you put it yeah and and what the I've, I've often had conversations and increasingly I've had conversations on the show with um, people who have had some form of deconstruction of their faith and, and that's very often Christians who basically were, were brought up in some particular way of understanding scripture or the bible be it some kind of you know being a creationist position or King James Version only position or whatever. And, and someone comes along and basically questions uh, or does something to, to kind of pull the rug from under them. And, yeah. and for some people, everything collapses and the pieces all scatter on the floor and they can't find a way of putting it together again. And, and the sad fact is for a lot of people, that means they, they go off into atheism uh, and whatever. But I also find a lot of people for whom everything falls apart but they do reconstruct and you sound like one of those people dale in, in as much as they realize okay maybe i did have uh things that i thought were somehow integral to this structure which actually simply aren't and actually i need to rethink some of the areas and and maybe uh some of the ideas i had were more to this particular church tradition and and way of thinking about things and actually truly historic christian faith and so on and so i find for those who do manage to reconstruct, what they come out with is a much stronger faith, um, something that actually they can take to the world and and kind of engage with it in a, in a much more holistic way than actually they could have done 
when they were existing in their previous kind of more brittle structure, where once that card gets taken out, the whole thing collapses like a de deck of cards. So for me, um, as much as it's a painful process for many people, the people who do go through it and reconstruct, t I tend to find they, their faith is that much tougher and, and deeper um, than it was before. Uh, that doesn't mean there are never any questions or mysteries. Of course, there are. And I think part of that journey is actually learning to live with the tension of things you can't necessarily answer and the, the, the questions that you don't necessarily have a complete explanation for. But that's OK, because I think you also learn what the things are that you can hold on to um, in, in a very kind of sound way. Um, so that would be my, uh, you know, hearing you mention that listener, Teddy, my my advice would be as well. Um, don't give up. Don't assume that just because some things are being questioned, uh, that that means the whole thing falls apart. Uh, it's worth going into this and and um, starting to put things together again, even if things seem to be being pulled apart in front of your eyes. Yeah, and that and that sort of goes hand in hand with one of the questions I wanted to ask you because I, I remember um, you, you were kind enough to to announce my conversion when I when I back in 2018 when I finally realized. I believe that Christianity is, is true, and I'm going to place my faith faith in it. I, I don't have all the answers and that sort of thing, but I have sufficient evidence to say I believe this is true. So I, I sort of mention I have sort of a weird methodology where where I literally break it up. Okay, there's positive evidences for the you know like the resurrection or shroud of Turin and that sort of thing. There are negative evidences, and I I actually assign normative probability values to, to each of those factors, uh, you know, um, and then I plug that into Bayes' theorem to get a cumulative overall probability, and I think it came out to 53.14%, and uh, <laughs> I know everyone laughs at that, but but it, it's a normative probability. I'm not saying this is the uh, sure. actual, you know, it, it, it was a heuristic tool that helped me make sense mm. and put everything together. Sure. So, sure, there were negative evidences where I couldn't find a totally satisfactory answer, but when weighed against all of the evidence combined, there's a sufficient amount. Um, yeah, I, was, I was just wondering, like, how, how do you how do you think people should, if they don't want to go down the route of assigning percent values and doing everything I did, how, how do you put everything together with all these? <laughs> well, well, I was so fascinated by your your journey, Dale, partly because it had this this very sort of philosophically rigorous approach to the way you would address the evidence and you use the Bayesian probability and everything else. And that'll go over most people's heads, obviously. But for you, it was an important part of the journey. And, and that's fine because you are you and, and your mind works in a way where you need to make sense of things in that kind of particular way. And and um, obviously, and you'll just accept that that's not going to be the way that other people necessarily do it all the time. But I think everyone, to some extent, is doing what you're doing in some form or another, which is they're sort of weighing the evidence, aren't they? They're simply saying what makes best sense of things to me. And and they may not be plugging this into some Bayesian probability calculation, but they they are doing things like saying, well, what does my experience tell me? What what do my deepest intuitions tell me about life? Um, what what evidence have I gathered from the way that person who calls himself a Christian lives their life? Um, what evidence have I gathered from, you know, what I read in the Bible and the, the arguments I've heard for and against it? And, and we're all in some way putting the pieces together, whether or not we call it a probabilistic calculation. We're we're doing that work of of looking at all the evidence around us. And then we're saying, now, what am I going to put my faith in here? And of course, it's not simply about, you know, for most people, it's not going to be about finding the right calculation, saying, OK, this is my best bet. I'm going to sort of stake my life on this. Um, it, it goes deeper than that, obviously. And, and and faith is not simply assenting to a set of propositions. It's actually about living your life in the light of of those claims, if you like. So for me, faith, you know, is at its most powerful when it's actually basing something on that, you know, living your life in a way that, you know, uh, is dependent upon Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, if we can see the arguments for his resurrection. But the question is, at what point does that become real in our life and where we actually stake something on it, where we go out and preach this gospel or live our lives in a way that, you know, genuinely puts puts our, our you know reputational life on the line in order to because we believe this so i think i think there's a sense in which um uh faith is both something that's um something that happens within us as we as we uh come to terms with with the data 
Uh, but it's also something that we live out. It, faith is something that you you do as well as believe, if you like. Um, so for me, that's really important to to accept that um, in the end, it's not just about the intellectual side of things. It's about um, living this out uh, and and if you like uh, trusting in in it. Uh, you know, there's going to be, as you say, lots of points in our life and things where we don't understand where we don't necessarily have an answer um and for me uh faith is trusting in the god that we do understand for the points in our life that we don't understand you know we're going yeah. through this coronavirus epidemic at the moment and there's many people asking the question where is god in all this and, and i don't necessarily have the, an obvious answer to them i can give them general principles but i'm not going to be able to stand up and say this is why this is happening or anything like that but i do believe there's enough that i know about god and about god's purposes and what i've seen in my life and others lives to make me trust that actually we can trust god through this that god will bring good out of this in the end and, and i think faith often operates like that um it's uh it, it's about actually a, a form of trust in god um having weighed the evidence and, and made a decision uh we we then live our lives in the light of that that's 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 one way that i found helpful to think about it yeah yeah and i i agree 100 percent. it's i mean even even uh in my case i yeah so okay great i i've got my overall it's more than 50 percent i i can now intellectually assent to christianity but then i had to take a step back and okay well what do i do with this i believe it's true and i think gary habermas uses the marriage analogy okay well well now what now you've got to make that faith commitment or that commitment in faith um and that sort of thing commit your life to christ yeah. and, and that's the key key thing and uh, i would say the hardest thing that the intellectual thing is almost easy just dealing with arguments but can you actually get your heart to to commit to christ as mm. as your as your lord and savior so yeah all right yeah yeah i think all right um so I think we've got about, I'm trying to keep to, to the time. We've got about s seven more minutes, uh, unless you want to go a bit longer. So I think I'll skip over some of the sections and I'll just go straight to the Christian doctrine aspects. I, I did want to get your, your perspective on both the women issue uh, and the issue of, of, of hell and what you make of that. So, so just starting with um, you know women in the Bible. So it's, it's a common... Uh, skeptical claim hey that the bible is sexist it, it says wives have to submit to their husbands women can't teach in the church obviously you know your wife lucy is is um is doing that um so so yeah what, what's your take on on the issue of, of women uh and their role in the church yeah well well i i accept that many christians take a different perspective from this and and in a way uh, i respect them uh, i'm not going to um uh, if you like, criticize them um, for simply holding to a different perspective on, on how they read the Bible in these respects. But personally, I find that um, there are good reasons for why um, we should definitely uh, accept the ministry of women in teaching and preaching in churches. Uh, typically, there are a few passages from the New Testament, most often they get quoted when it comes to those who don't believe um, that women should have a role in, in teaching and preaching. Um, and they come from uh, books like uh, First Timothy and um, elsewhere in Corinthians and things. And uh, without running over all of the uh, the specific passages, um, uh, I think I think first of all that the big thing to recognise, and, and this has been helpful for me, is to recognise that uh, Jesus, in his example in his life, um, gave women a role and status that was completely out of keeping with the culture in which he lived. Um, women, uh, as much as he, of course, had 12 disciples who were men, it's also a fact, if you simply read the Gospels, that he had many women followers as well, uh, and that these women were very important and integral in his ministry. It's notable that first people who discovered the empty tomb and told the news of the resurrection were women. And again, it's been commonly pointed out in apologetics that um, it would be a very strange story to make up if you were trying to make up a resurrection story to have women as the first um, discoverers of the empty tomb, given the way their testimony was perceived in that time and culture. And I think throughout the Gospels, you know, in his interactions with women, you see Jesus giving a dignity in place to women that is almost unheard of at that time and place. And I think that ha continues to happen. There's a trajectory in the New Testament in which we see women taking important 
roles in the church. Um, there's uh, the Apostle Junius that's mentioned. There's Phoebe who delivers the letter to the Romans. Um, there are, you know, Priscilla and Aquila, um, you know, a husband and wife team who are seen as apostles. And despite the fact that there are some passages in which Paul seems to or appears to, um, if you like, delegate certain roles to men and women, um, I think there are important, helpful ways of understanding those in the context that they're given. Um, so, um, you know, you mentioned that one of the things you just mentioned was the passage in Ephesians, which talks about wives submit to your husbands. Well, what people often fail to also mention is that the very verse just before that says submit to one another. Um, and and the point is, it, then Paul goes on to describe ways in which that's how that submission might look. Um, and it talks about wives submitting to their husbands. It talks about husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. And and that itself is an act of servanthood and, and a form of submission. So I don't think it's that you suddenly say, oh, it's just the women who are submitting. Actually, in that very verse that just precedes that 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 verse in Ephesians, it says submit to one another. Um, so so I, I take the view that in marriage, it's about mutual submission. It's about, you know, that is what marriage is. It's it's a it's a picture of Christ in the church. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to, to you know, women, the, the specific verses that appear to have something to say about women, um, preaching or keeping silence in church. Again, without going into too much detail, I think there are good ways to understand why culturally in those specific instances, there were reasons why Paul gave that particular advice. And it's sometimes been misunderstood, I think. Um, and, and when you look at the bigger sweep of scripture, uh, it seems to me that you have women taking all kinds of roles in prophecy and speaking and teaching in the New Testament, which which would which seem to, to go against that particular interpretation of those verses in places like First Timothy and so on. So, um, yeah, that would be my my overall take on that one. Why I particularly think think um, I take what what is sometimes called an egalitarian view on on those issues. Um, the hell issue uh, is is another interesting one. Um, this is one where I essentially you know would say I changed my mind in the course of doing unbelievable. I probably began from a point of view that was the eternal conscious torment view, the view that um, hell is a place of um, eternal punishment, um, uh, if you like. Uh, and it was really just through some of the shows, especially people like Chris Date, um, who runs a um, an organization called Rethinking Hell, um, who helped me to see that actually um, what we've often understood as being passages about eternal conscious torment in in the New Testament uh, are, have been misunderstood, I think, very often. And actually, the predominant image is one of um, a final end, uh, if you like, um, you know, most frequently the word that's translated hell in the New Testament is actually the word Gehenna, which refers to a sort of waste dump outside Jerusalem. And um, the point being that the waste is burnt up. There's a there's a final end to it. There's um, and very often uh, I think there's been a misunderstanding that stems as much from the medieval period as anything about the nature of hell. And for me, it makes more sense theologically, biblically and philosophically and ethically to see that those who do ultimately reject God, who ultimately reject Christ, they cease to exist, that, that because they've cut themselves off from the source of existence, that they, they, they cease to exist. And that is what's often called the annihilationist view or conditional immortality view. Uh, so so I've, that's, that's one area where I'd say I've changed. And for some Christians, that would be a critical issue. And, you know, that would stop them from me being able to minister in their organization or whatever it is. But in general, I find actually these issues t tend to be seen as secondary, at least these days. Um, they don't t tend to be issues that will stop Christians who differ on these particulars about women and hell and those sorts of things still being able to work together by and large because they aren't seen as fundamental if you like to the christian message in that way gotcha. yeah i think um I'll, I'll just there's not much i can add in, in terms of the women thing i i'm an egalitarian I'm, I'm on i think justin made excellent points that i agree with um just to sort of back back him up as well and the, with the wives submit to your husbands it's important to note that paul is co-opting how ancient roman household codes right like oh mm. children you have to obey your parents slaves obey your masters wives submit it doesn't say obey it says submit to your husband so so paul's actually co-opting that and and revolutionizing it for for the time and that sort of goes along with what justin was, was saying that there's it, it's showing an unprecedented respect for for the role of women and, and wives in relation to their husbands on the hell issue uh, 
I, I currently, so I, I disagree with the annihilationist perspective myself, but I, I will say that it was Justin saying that he had changed his mind on that topic that actually made me stop and think, okay, maybe I should actually seriously consider this. It's not just, a, oh, this is a stupid view or something that fake Christians believe in. No, there, there might be something here. And yeah, I think Justin raises some good points to, to look into. I, I definitely think the torture chamber model of hell where, you know, demons are like the medieval conception, Dante's Inferno, that that is not biblical at all. Um, but yeah, what, one last follow-up question for you on the hell issue then. Mm. I'm just sort of, sort of curious, Justin, what do you make of people like Gary Habermas or J.P. Moreland? They, they have uh, the view that I take, which is called the quarantine model of hell. Uh, so it's like relational, you know, relational absence from God and that sort of thing. It, mm -hmm. it, it's eternal. And they, they'll argue, well, look, it would be immoral if God just externally annihilates everyone. It's violating a principle of existence. We we as human beings or image bearers of God have this, this ultimate value that God can't just snuff out and annihilate it. It has to maintain their existence. Yeah, like, what do you make of that if you've heard of it? Yeah, I mean, I, as I say, I, I, I'm open to the idea that, that there are there are different models that the potential work, and, and in a way, I don't I don't kind of in a sense lose sleep. I think the quarantine model and, and what you're describing sounds a little bit like maybe where N.T. Wright lands up. He talks about this idea of um, people kind of uh, where the, the image of God they 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 reflect less and less and less the image of God to the extent yeah. that they become sort of a shallow former person almost um, in this way. And I don't know if that's that's similar in some ways, but the that th th there's something in that i think i think for me you see whether you call it annihilationism or 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 some sort of shallow ghostly existence that that people end up in um for me it's whether it's insubstantial to the point of being nothing um means that you kind of potentially arrive at the same conclusion anyway i i feel like um god for me i've, I've always taken that kind of c.s lewis position that um people choose for themselves essentially to cut themselves off from god that, that that's not something god imposes on them it's not that god is there actively willing them out of existence but that they choose to cut themselves off from the source of life and and therefore in that sense will themselves out of existence and for me god gives people you know god is not going to um, stand against what people ultimately want and he gives them that freedom to do that and for me that that may look like something like the quarantine sort of result but for me i i find that the, the annihilation model as far as i can see makes more sense that that, that, that there's a sense in which it's um pe people's choices ultimately mean that they uh choose to essentially yeah close the doors on god and then they've effectively closed the doors on themselves in the process uh so I, I, I guess I am. But again, it's one of those things where, frankly, I haven't really looked into a great depth into the views of people like Moreland and others um, have uh, and And I'd be happy to, to look and potentially revise my opinions, you know, if I felt like actually they're making a good point there and and so on. Um, I, I guess ultimately I do have that sense that, you know, if God is um, ultimately bringing all things back into line with himself, uh, in, in the new creation it's hard for me to see that there's also this little pocket of creation which is still effectively in rebellion against god um and i i for me again the annihilationist view sort of deals with that because it says actually ultimately everyone who wants to go their own way goes their own way and ex excludes themselves from from reality in that sense so that god is all in all ultimately in in his ultimate purposes so so I think for me, there's there's something also about the fact that I don't like the idea almost of there still being this pocket of however it's small and insignificant it may be. There's still this quarantine chamber with these souls in rebellion against God in some way that doesn't seem fitting to me of this God who, um, you know, has brought the whole of heaven and earth back to himself in, in some way. Um, yeah. So so that that would be my my un, untutored thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I just want to say thank you, because you, something in your answer just sort of clicked with me. It was a factor that I hadn't considered before as well about the view. So I want to think about that and reevaluate that my, myself about, 
you know, people over hell, in terms of the value argument, people for an eternity over hell, mm. could it ever get to the point where it's of an equal, quote unquote, utility as just annihilating that soul? Like there's this net zero mm. value. In that case, it wouldn't mm. matter. Yeah, well, that, that's something I, I will consider. I hadn't heard that before. So, yeah. Um, all right. Well, I, I want to ask you one last uh, non-serious question, but uh, just to, to end off very okay. <laughs> um, sure, so sure. You know, I, I make this pretense, uh, you know, Sarah is always going after me. One, one of our mutual listeners, Sarah, is always going after me. Dale, you're all about the intellect. You're, you're always logical. You like the, the, my favorite shows of Unbelievable are, are usually the substantive ones, the, the ones where Justin's like, well, this is a, a bit deep. I, I'm like, yes, that, that's what I want. But I will, I will throw with that pretense. My favorite show of all time uh, is one that is the least substantive. It's one that you did 10 years ago with uh, a person named yeah. B. Strong. Uh, a person say named, again? Who? A, a person B. named B. Yes, B. I Strong. Remember this. And uh, J. Yes. J. B. Um, my goodness, my question to you, is there ever going to be a round two with, with B. Strong? Because <laughs> I was laughing for weeks. After. I, I... <laughs> Yeah, you'd, you'd have to go back and listen to that episode to, to, to realise what you're talking about there, Dale. But no, I don't think there will be a round, a round two with B Strong. B, B Strong, I never really heard back from again after that show. Um, and as you can tell, that wasn't even their real name. Um, so so I don't know. That was That's one of those ones that will go down in history as one of the, the strangest potentially shows that I, I ever experienced or hosted. Um, I, I don't think I quite knew what I was letting myself in for when I when I set that one up. But um, yeah, you've given me a laugh just by reminding me of that one, Dale. So, so thank you very much. And, and I'll put that in the sources for for the audience. I'll I'll put that episode in the sources. So go back and, and have a listen to that. It was uh, it was interesting. Uh, let's say that. So yeah, thank thank you so much, Justin, for for coming on the show. As I said, it it really means a lot to me. I, I've been a fan of your thing of your show for over a decade now. So. It was an honor uh, getting to speak to you. Dale, thank you so much. So good to uh, to know that you've been listening that long, and it's been a real pleasure joining you on your podcast. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much. And next week, just for the audience, so I have another one of my famous Shroud Wars debates coming on. So I'm, I'm bringing on Hugh Ferry uh, as the Shroud Skeptic or the, the Shroud Demon, as Tyler like Tyler B likes to call him, and also a, a new pro Shroud advocate, uh, Mark Antinachi. He's uh, a lawyer. He's a pro Shroud advocate. He's he's one of the best out there. So um, yeah, they're they're coming on board, and Teddy is going to be joining me as a, a cross examiner for that. So yeah, that's what we got coming up next week. And have a good week, everybody.